Australian and state government support for business recovery from COVID-19 lockdowns by grants, loans and concessions. Today we will look at the coming out of lockdown. We need to review our business entitlements and see what assistance is available to us and to our clients. Our key focuses today will be how can we access government incentives to power our businesses into 2022? What does it mean to my business? And is it time to refinance our existing facilities? About a month ago, I called Praveen to invite him to join me in this seminar, and he gave me an appointment on Saturday. He was simply busy helping local clients access entitlements following a generous announcement by the federal government. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. My name is Paul Rowftree and I am CEO of Projects RH based in Sydney. And today I'm joined by Praveen Manakat Tala, founder of K, sorry, PKM Tax Professionals, Chartered Accountants. Praveen studied at London South Bank University and then undertook his CA exams in the city of London. Some 24 years ago, he established his accounting practice in Sydney, where he assists offshore and medium companies to manage opportunities and to get government support to grow and work with their businesses. Pravin is a tax professional, but a business advisor at heart. Pravin has an interesting mix of Australian and international clients. He is a knowledgeable professional who can read into numbers based on his experience. Praveen, we've discussed it over the last few months, several of our clients who are looking to see if they can make a jump when the doors open. Praveen, welcome. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for the invite and uh, pleasure to be here. Praveen, when we talk about a business grant, what are we really talking about? Paul, uh, as a big picture, I feel that Australia is one of the countries where we spend a lot of money on business development. The government supports that by way of grants and encourages all levels of businesses so they can they can do their best and achieve their utmost with, for the benefit of themselves, the community and the country. So the government has given about 700 grants at different levels of state and federal. They, they are available to the uh, businesses at, at various levels, at small turnovers, startups, even, even large companies as well. So as a structure, the whole country is based on supporting businesses via grants. And one thing that I just want to add here is recently, the government had given a grant, not that much, but $15,000, for businesses that was run by ladies. It was to promote <laughs> where the shareholders and the business directors and the committee directors and the operators were ladies so that they can enhance the, the ladies' enthusiasm and bring that to the light. So overall speaking, we have a fantastic grant system over here. Thank you, Praveen. Pleasure. What is critical to the, the inquiries from my clients in particular have been the two announcements by the Treasurer contained in his budget speeches of the 10th of October 2020 and the 11th of May this year. There are several what appear to be generous opportunities to get government support for what we're doing. And what I think is critical is to look at the ones that are applicable to most businesses. There's payments to create apprenticeships, sandbox rules for patent income and r d grants abound again we see big news but will most businesses actually have the opportunity to get any of these 700 opportunities you speak of look uh no no that won't be applicable to all businesses but yes uh, uh, some businesses can avail of that there are guidelines as to what condition you have to meet so, so there'll be only few people who can benefit from that. But you mentioned about uh, uh, um, apprenticeships and, and sandbox patient income and R&D. Those are standard grants that are available. See, 
apprenticeship is definitely there. We want to have more people who can come in the workforce and learn and build their businesses. Uh, and sandbox rules as well. That's the bit of bit of grant is there available as well, but not it's not as common. But of course, one of the big ones is the R and D grant, which is of course very effective to help businesses improve their uh, uh, R and D research. Praveen, a number of our clients do get R and D grants, and they tell me eventually. What they say to me is that even though they work through the tax system. They need to get expert advice, provide opinions to the tax office, which they don't otherwise need. Do you think that this effort is worthwhile? And, and why is the tax office taking so long to approve them? Okay, look, a good question, very good question. Um, the ATO and the government system wants people to improve their technology and the country to have better uh, uh, technology because we don't have that much in terms of manufacturing. So our approach is now going towards R&D. R&D at the same time as well is a very subjective uh, topic as well, because what do you mean by R&D? What is research and what is development? Basically, you have to show that you've made a product which wasn't there before. Now, to show that and prove that on a piece of paper isn't as easy. So, so what I do is with my clients, I help them out with, with the strategies of documentation and all the things that's required, where I find that where the client is a bit more involved, I sometimes get help of other accounting firms who are in the middle tier firm to help me with that focus so that I can give the best outcome for my clients, which I can do as much work and, and I can get help if I need to. But RD definitely is there to stay and the government wants to increase that potential for the businesses. That's very helpful. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you. Praveen, a number of our clients have really had a hard time during the lockdown. They have exhausted a lot of their cash, particularly those in Victoria, where they've been paying wages, but they've had lockdowns. Many of them are, are worried about the availability of money. I mean, they go to their banks and other providers and they talk about SME loan schemes, but they are frightened they're just not going to get any money. Can you please comment about the availability of money specifically loans, and, and what has been the impact of the various statements of the Australian Treasurer saying that he'll back 80% of loans, not 100%? Good question. Um, I think the, the intention of the government is good, that yes, the government will support the, the banks, in this case, to support the businesses with the 80% guaranteed scheme. But the issue then is, I've spoken to bank managers as well, and they're saying, Praveen, look, we don't mind supporting the customer. The problem we have is that if there's a 20% loss to our business, say, for example, like we're not talking small loans as well, you could have 20, 20, $100 million loans as well. The government, it can afford to lose 80% of, of, their, of their guarantee, so to speak. But we, as, as banks who are loyal to our shareholders and our customers, can't afford to have a 20% loss, which will go straight to the bottom line. So therefore, they will could suffer uh, from the shareholding structure as well, which shares will drop and so on. So they are willing to give loans, but still under the same normal criteria of serviceability and affordability by the, by the business. So the idea is good, but put in practice isn't as easy. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you. The, another one that I think it's really important as we open up Australia to the world again, uh, the export market development grants. I mean, the key condition of this is you need to be a producer of something or an exporter of services. The grant is 50% of your marketing costs. So you have to spend it in advance mm. and then you make an application and you hope to get it reimbursed. Now, the maximum grant you can get to 150,000 and your turnover has to be less than $50 million. Do you think this will be popular once Australia opens, but more importantly, if our clients take the risk and spend that money, do you think they'll get it back? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, that grant has been, of course, available for many, many years. And yes, some clients, clients have made use of that. The grant is there to be taken under the right structure. So moving forward, 
my concern is that, uh, uh, first of all, when will the world open up? Where would you like to go and set up your uh, 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 and expand your business? Which country, which region? I have a concern there as well. There could be delay because of the, the travel constraints. So this will take some time to develop. Okay, as you must happen for the last three, four years. The issue then becomes, uh, um, can the business, first of all, fund that project? You see, export grant and export expenditure is a small expense in the whole business structure. You, you have the wages, you have manufacturing, you have other aspects as well. So to answer your question reg regarding, will that be uh, reimbursed? Yes, the government will not do anything wrong by, by, the, by the business. As long as you meet the criteria and for her proper record keeping and records, the government will support you of, of the reimbursement of the 50%. Not a problem with all of that. But you don't, be, don't be creative. <laughs> Another one of the grants, Praveen, that our clients are particularly interested in is something called the Entrepreneurs Program. Um, they see that as a relatively large amount of money available. I believe they're looking for a million dollars each. I was wondering if you could comment about is that difficult to get or is, okay, it, that, is there are special rules that most most companies can't get that look again there are strict rules because this grant is for australians in australia okay and again if you don't have tight rules like anything else the 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 grants can be misused or claimed when they're not to, to be used by the right right businesses so i don't mind where the where the criteria is defined and it's it's precise and it's strict is okay because the company has to then find the resources to be able to use that uh, benefit as well. So I think the only issue I find is that in many cases, like in this case also, many people don't know about this grant. So therefore, it hasn't been as utilized. Thank you, Praveen. Thank you. A number of our clients uh, have been coming back to us to talk about key lending criteria is about debt service cover ratios and the ability to have cash in the business or some hard assets. They've been saying, mm, perhaps I should be looking at non-banks as a preferred lender. They might have sharper pencils. Are you seeing that fintechs are competing with established banks? Do they have the volume of money to lend that the established banks do have? And have they been getting more money from the Commonwealth like the, the banks seem to be getting? Sure, good question. Thank you. See, first of all, let's understand what money means. Money to a business means how they can use the money to, to make a profit out of that. But again, the lender is saying, hang on, I don't want to lose 100% just because I'm getting 3% or 4% as, as my return. So the, the, the balance is there. At the moment, the market is nervous. The government, the government is trying to help the market, but the market itself is nervous because we don't know what's going to be happening next next year. So yes, there are non-bank lenders around who now are asking for a little more interest than the, of course, you know, normal banking system, but they're asking for more security as well. Because again, at the moment, everyone's nervous about the whole structure, what's going to happen in the next two, three years. Well, I, I think that's really important because it leads on to the, the thing that we've been telling our clients and they've been benefiting from. Like when they approach any lender, they need to be prepared. They really need to have their accounts up to date, their tax returns lodged. Yep. And even if it's not good news, they need to have it there in black and white. And we're saying to them that they need to have business plans, they need to have information memorandums and financial models. Because if they go to a bank, Quite frankly, banks have got lots of people queued up wanting things. Mm. They're going to deal with the ones that are easier to deal with. And they show they're professional and have that information ready. They're saying they're worried about the cost. And what we're going back to them and saying, even if you're applying for $20,000 now, you need to show you're organised. And the very point you made, Previn, is banks want to make sure they've got security so they will be repaid. And even if they're only risking that 20 cents in the dollar because the Commonwealth government's underwriting the, the 80 cents, as you said, they've got to protect their shareholders' interests. What we've been saying to these clients is you really need to have a plan. 
your information needs to be organized and these same things they need when they go for specialist applications so if they go for grants in technical research they've got to have their proposal prepared job creation they've got to set out how they're going to create jobs and for market development they've got to have a plan that cost it so the information they need they need to go get first what our clients are coming back and just telling us those in trade that they need additional cash because shipping times have blown out that they can't get containers ships are taking longer to come and if they don't have it in stock they can't sell it so there's this idea that they've got to actually build up their inventories and they need more working capital because the stock is taking longer to come they've got to hold inventories what do you think about this? And are there smarter ways for them to hold those inventories? Okay, very good question again. <clears throat> we touch a few points here. So let me just start from the beginning. You mentioned about the banks uh, uh, wanting to have more structured information and so that they can see how the business is going and everything else, and which is now easily available in terms of budgeting projections. Uh, uh, the software packages encourage that as well. So it's not that you have to spend too much money on an accountant to go and get those type of information. So definitely a bank will support a business which is better structured in the reporting. And of course, the asset backing as well. I have a client where they have a, it's a, it's a small loan in the big picture, about $3 million loan. The bank audits them every month. Bank looks at the ATO statements, looks at the transactions to make sure they are doing OK. Also now what's happening is banks can do that very easily. Before, you had to have so many resources to check a few things. Now it's a piece of cake. So, so banks are very much focusing on live activities of, of, of the business. Unlike the olden days, you would give, give a loan, see you in two years' time. Or you send me financials in two years' time. Not anymore. And there's no way banks will let that risk take place of giving $5, $10 million and getting a small amount for that and letting that become bad debt. The other question you mentioned was about the stock. 100% right. We have such a big issue now with uh, not being able to get stock from, from overseas. So therefore, you have to build up your stock that you have on hand. And I'm finding clients are having gaps of like four weeks, five weeks beyond getting in stock. So what they're doing is when the ships come in, they want to pile up. So now they got like, for example, once clients got about two months stock, they normally would be holding two weeks stock. Again, like you said, can't have, if you don't have the stock, you can't sell, you can't make a profit. So ultimately, the whole structure has changed the last eight, 12 to 18 months. Uh, uh, and the business needs to be very aware of its risks of holding too much stock, because then you've got too much in stock and you don't have enough in cash. And also, it can happen in some cases, you may be having perishables. So those Thank are the issues you have to balance out. Thank you, Prapin. One of the other things we hear about is job maker. Now, we heard a lot about job keeper, and now we're hearing about job maker. I, I get the feeling it's something like the apprenticeship system. They're trying to create jobs. Can you tell us what it is, but more importantly, how do employers get it? Good question. Uh, job maker is basically trying to say that we will make jobs for you. So that basically is someone who is not employed for a little, little while, and also in the certain age bracket, 18 to 35. So it's a very restrictive market. So even though, the again, the concept is interesting that the, the government wants to employ people who have not been employed for a little while to come into the scheme, and also the government then gives a credit to, to the employer towards their expenses and everything else. But I'm finding that, again, it's a good concept, but it's not as used because it's not easy to get someone and that age group that you may want to have to, to be part of your business. Because in some cases, the person who's not employed is not being employed because they didn't have the right skills. So that's how it's, it's falling at the moment. I'm not hearing too many people using that, that type of uh, scheme at the moment. All right, Praveen, thank you for that. One of the things that occurred to me when I heard the Treasurer's most recent statement of the 21st of August was that we should be getting our clients to look at refinancing. One of the things he said was 
that these loan guarantees, et cetera, would be available for refinancing. Do you think the financial institutions are going to be happy about that? Because effectively, our clients are going to want to get their money cheaper. Very good point. Um, <clears throat> by the way, what's happened now is, of course, as you know, we were the lowest interest rates ever in Australia. Okay, 0.1%. I mean, you know, how can it be that? It's like 0%. And by the way, around the whole world, more than 100 countries have got the interest rates below 1%. The whole country is going through the same phase at the moment of, of low interest rates. There's not enough to go around to the north of inflation as well. So, so from that point of view, best time to, to borrow if you can, or refinance if you can. Because again, the banks are more strict as well with, with the lending criteria. But best time to refinance. And in fact, you can take it a step further. Refinance in a fixed fixed uh, 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 period, two years, three years, because the chance of the rates going up dramatically in this period is very, very low. So you might as well get the benefit because they will go up by the way. It could be one year, two years, I don't know exactly when. It will start creeping up because they're too low at the moment. Thank you, Praveen. Back in 2009, the Australian uh, Society of CPAs and the Australian Bankers Association produced a fact sheet entitled Refinancing Your Business. Yeah. And quite frankly, I wish I could say I read it at university. <laughs> I did read it and I kept it and put it aside because it really was a series of fundamentals which are evergreen. It had a handy checklist of what clients needed to bring to a bank or another financial institution. One of the key things is they needed to ask themselves what they're really going to do with the money and how they're going to be able to refinance it, repay it. Under the current interest rate environment, I agree they should be refinancing, but there is a real pressure on companies to take up more debt. Do you think that the financial institutions are going to look at the fundamentals and say to some businesses, you can't really do that, but more importantly, say to some of their good clients, you've got capacity, and if you want to go make an acquisition or st do something as the economy lifts, we're going to be there for you. Because what's really important to our clients, Praveen, is they're in growth. They want to make more out of their business. Is that a, is now a time, as you said, not only to refinance and get a lower cost and therefore be making more money, but to say we have the capacity to do a merger or an acquisition and therefore should I be going to the bank with the plan now and get a pre-approval? Mm -hmm. Oh, very good question. Interesting question is that. Okay, uh, the first point you mentioned was about stock and, and so on. So, again, uh, what's happening now is with the last six, eight months, uh, compared to what it was before, for example, in the olden days, you would have your uh, uh, stock turnover ratio to see what is the best optimum uh, stock you should hold so that you're not put, putting too much in stock and less in cash and other, other assets. And, and you would always worry, I have got too much, or should, I should be only carrying about four weeks, I'm carrying six weeks, eight weeks. But what has changed now? The moment, I'm telling my clients, don't worry about the, the turnover ratio, stock turnover ratio, because focus on your supply to the customer. It is important, in fact, important to hold more stock now than before, so that you can, you can, what if, what if something happens in six weeks time and we have closure of borders? We have constraints regarding importation. So the moment focus is stock is king now. Before it was cash is king, now stock is king. So that you can use that stock to, to run your business. So that. Now, other point you mentioned about was mergers and acquisitions. Look, a uh, very interesting question because, yes, you're right. There could be a good time for a larger business which can see that a smaller business doesn't have the resources to survive or do, not do as well. So therefore, one could try and acquire that business. So. Again, the banks will look at look at the new businesses' assets because banks don't lend on goodwill. They, they, they lend on assets. So they have to look at the machinery or the stock, those fixed items that they can see, oh, we can lend against that. So yes, as an idea, very good timing because you have 
money available at a much lower rate than ever before. So, Praveen, given what you've said so far, with com if companies have outstanding receivables, should they look at refinancing those to bring them into line by factoring them? Okay, the way it works is that the banks have to first of all approve debt of adults. And okay. that, in many cases, they are maybe concerned if you have uh, uh, overdue debts, and if someone's more than 60 days, they say, hey, we don't want to be taking that risk. So, so, so banks would normally, yeah, normally walk in and say, fine, we're okay to take your 30 days so called outstanding debtors. And they'll do a test check as well to see are these good guys or, or will they survive or not? Banks, of course, are taking a big risk. Of, of taking a, a particular structure where it falls apart, they will lose a lot of money. So, so the banks would definitely do due diligence and make sure that the customers can pay them back. So they're they definitely, definitely in terms of in terms of one more option. Yes, good option to have. It's funny we go back to an adage that my grandmother said, "Cash is king." Yes, um, cash is king. <laughs> Prabhin, thank you very much for your insights into the business world and that of finance, and for your, especially for your time today. Paul, well, really appreciate this. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed this so much. Thank you. Kind of you. Bye-bye. My name is Paul Rauftree, and I'm the CEO of Projects RH based in Sydney. And today I've had with me Pravin Manakatala, the founder of PKM Tax Professionals Chartered Accountants in Sydney. He is an international corporate advisor. And thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, goodbye for now.